uh, we start now. Amir? Amir? Uh, hello, hi there. Uh, good evening. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is uh, Dr. Sahil Abdullah Rukin. I'm a consultant neurologist, and at the same time, I'm the president of Emirates Neural Society. It's my pleasure today to be chairing this uh, uh, webinar uh, on behalf of uh, Hamdan Medical Award and it's uh, honored to be with a distinguished speakers and one of the uh, honored uh, researcher at the level of the globe. Uh, the Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum Award for Medical Science has been established in 1999 by the visionary of the late Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Allah Yarhama, has been a driven force to support the medical sector at the level of the region and global. In collaboration for a decade with academia and healthcare sector to fund distinctive uh, research and honor excellence in the service. These efforts has paid off well as two of the gener uh, of Grand Hamdan Award winners were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 2010 and 2020. Uh, Sir uh, Robert Edward and Dr. Javier Alter. Here, I would like to welcome the Board of Trustees member who are great supporter for the award virtual activity, which is monthly, and we are welcoming all of them to join us today. As you are seeing on this picture, Sheikh Hamdan Allah with our speaker, Professor Christian Haas, the winner of Hamdan Award for Medical Research Excellence in 2005-2006 for his research in cytokines and pathogenesis and th uh, therapy of a disease. Currently, Professor Haas is the chair of biochemistry, medical faculty of Lord uh, Wing Maximilian University in Munich, Germany, and speaker for German Center of Neurodegenerative Disease and Munich Cluster for Systems Neurology. Tonight, our distinguished speaker are going to speak about a very sensitive area in neurology and neuroscience about Alzheimer's disease. As many people know that as we are advancing in age, the risk of having Alzheimer's disease are increasing. There's more than 55 million victims who lives currently with dementia worldwide. And there are nearly 10 million new cases every year. Alzheimer's disease contributed to 60 to 70% of all cases of dementia worldwide. And dementia has a physical, physiological, social, and economic impacts, not only for a people lives, living with dementia, but also for their uh, careers and family and society at large. Tonight, our professor will speak about the microglia modulation in Alzheimer's disease, innovation therapies, or devilish gambling. Welcome, Prof, tonight to our webinar. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me um, as a speaker. Now, um, I will you try can. to um, share my screen. Yeah. You can. So yeah. we can see it, Prof. Second. So now you should see um, the title slide, basically. <clears throat> yes, okay, we, we see it, yes. Then I get started. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much again for um, inviting me. And of course, I have great uh, memories um, on the day when I received this fantastic award, a long time ago, actually. So what I do today is I will want to introduce you into kind of a new field um, where we are working on since a couple of years, and that's uh, the role of microglia in Alzheimer's disease. 
So before I do that, I give you a little introduction where I work. And I will also tell you a little bit um, why I believe so strongly in the amyloid cascade hypothesis. So this is the institute where I work in Munich, where we moved in in 2014. It's the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, or in Germany called DZNE. And throughout Germany, uh, we have nine such centers. A tenth is just coming up in addition. And um, we work basically on all aspects of Alzheimer's disease. So from patient care to clinical research, clinical trials, um, molecular biology, basic research, everything you can imagine is covered in these different institutions. And what we do in Munich is mostly um, functional research and target identification and then preclinical work. But we also have a small um, clinical study unit and we plan to bring some of our targets also at some point, hopefully, into the clinic. Now, the DZNE has a total of 1,200 employees, so it became fairly big. Um, we are a permanent institution and um, which receives permanent funding, but of course, as always, uh, depending on international reviews, which currently happen every seven years. Now, our mission is pretty clear. So our chancellor stated that um, at the occasion of the opening of our institute. So here she said, um, we need to understand prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease. So simple statement, but quite a challenge um, for the future um, because um, understand Alzheimer's disease is something, but prevent Alzheimer's disease or cure Alzheimer's disease, that means a lot. Specifically, if you think that in the moment, as we speak, every three seconds, a patient is being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, that means if we don't find treatment, by the year um, uh, 2050, we will have about 131 million people being uh, affected with Alzheimer's disease if we don't find cure or prevention. And that is a number which no modern society can handle anymore. That's way too much. And um, we need to have treatment by that time at the very, very latest. So how can we do this? So what I always thought from the beginning on, we need to go back to the pathology. And currently it's very modern um, to argue that the, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease is super complicated. But if you compare it to many other neurodegenerative diseases, it's not. Um, what we have here are numerous of amyloid plaques and um, these are extracellular. And then we have tangles, these are these black structures um, in, inside the neurons and um, uh, then we, it looks like that these dying neurons, these are black neurons which are about to die, um, that they're poisoned by something which diffuses out of the um, amyloid plaque. And that's of course a peptide called amyloid beta peptide. And this amyloid beta peptide seems to be released from the plaque, probably not as a monomer, but maybe as soluble small very toxic oligomers. Now, I like um, the amyloid cascade a lot, and that's something I was working on now since um, 31 years. So we believe that amyloid is on top of this cascade. Amyloid forms plaques, the plaques induce the tangles, and then the tangles are basically the executioners um, for the cell death. So what that means for treatment is also pretty clear. So for treatment, we should go in as early as possible, meaning at the beginning um, of the amyloid cascade. So this is how we drew the amyloid cascade probably yeah, a decade ago. In the meantime, there's one mistake in this nice picture. So you need to move amyloid away from here and much, much further, further upstream in the river, probably even to the place where the spring is located. So miles and miles and miles upstream. And that shows you already at the beginning, the big problem of treatment. You, if you wanna treat the disease via an amyloid um, drug, you need to, to treat very, very early on, decades before the clinician sees anything. So now let's talk a little bit about um, how amyloid is being generated. It's made from a precursor called the amyloid precursor protein. And um, here, this protein is a 100 kilodalton protein. 
and the amyloid cascade needs to be cleaved out of it. And um, the first enzyme cleaving um, is beta secretase, it cleaves C at the N terminus, then gamma secretase comes cleaving at the C terminus, and that liberates amyloid out of the cell. Here it starts to form these little oligomers, which form then fibers in the long run, and the fibers at the end form the amyloid plug. Now the problem is all that is, uh, for a long time it was believed um, that amyloid is produced obviously only in patients, um, but this is not true. Unfortunately, all of us, everyone who is listening currently to my talk, including myself, unfortunately, um, is producing amyloid in the brain constantly. So um, th this is the big, big problem because this constant production of amyloid basically means that we have a ticking time bomb in our brain. And that also explains why we all have such a huge chance to get Alzheimer's disease. Now, why am I now so much convinced that amyloid is the cause of the disease? There are numerous arguments brought up constantly by my scientific colleagues, but also very aggressively uh, in the public, in the news. And I think they tend to forget something very important. And these are some clear scientific facts which we simply should keep in mind. Now, this argument here has been found uh, back in the late 80s uh, by Konrad Weibeuter um, here in Germany and is apparently completely forgotten. So the amyloid precursor protein gene is located on chromosome 21. And you all know what happens um, when you have one chromosome too much of chromosome 21. Um, these patients with the trisomy develop uh, Down syndrome. And all these patients um, develop also an early Alzheimer's disease pathology mostly beginning at around the um, age of 50, so way too early. Why that? It's very simply, they have one copy too much um, of the amyloid, of the APP gene, and produce too much amyloid. <clears throat> and this overproduction of amyloid induces the disease. Now, another argument, or many arguments now, come from familiar Alzheimer's disease. So in familiar Alzheimer's disease, um, we have mutations, autosomal dominant, extremely rare mutations, which cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. And they cause that already at an age of around 40. So it's a super aggressive form um, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, very different um, from the age of onset of normal Alzheimer's disease, which normally is between 70 and 80 or so. And there have been mutations, of course, um, found. And the search was very intense and currently and I think that's basically it. There are mutations in three different genes. And you will be surprised. Um, they are in the amyloid precursor protein gene and two genes called presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. And um, families which suffer um, from mutations in these three genes, they uh, develop Alzheimer's disease with 100% probability, probability. So the penetrance of these mutations is almost complete, unfortunately. Now, we are working with these patients um, together very carefully in our institute, and we participate in a system, in a cohort, which is called Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Disease Network, or DIAN. And I will tell you much more about this um, later on, uh, because we did a very nice biomarker study, or two biomarker studies um, now on these DIAN patients. Now, what's very interesting is there was a couple of years ago a very moving, uh, a, a very sad movie showing the story of a young professor um, who suffered um, from familiar Alzheimer's disease. The movie is called Still Alice and the um, major actor, um, she got um, the, the, um, an Oscar award for that. And what they perfectly show is exactly the symptoms Alzheimer's disease patients which suffer from, from dominant mutations um, uh, um, uh, basically have. So um, this movie is really challenging to watch because you see a young super intelligent person declining with an incredible speed and all the clinical measures um, they're doing with her then um, this is exactly um, what we are doing here in the clinic as well. So let's have a look where these mutations which cause familiar Alzheimer's disease are located. So the first set of mutations is, are exactly located where the two secretases cleave. So exactly where beta and gamma secretase cleave. 
There's a third class of mutations, and that these are actually the most abundant ones, and they're located right here in the gamma sequences itself. And there are already more than, I think, more than 300 different mutations, which all cause familiar Alzheimer's disease. So the location of these mutations by themselves is already um, quite informative, because apparently um, they all cluster at sites which are important for amyloid production, and all of them cause unequivocally early onset Alzheimer's disease. So what are they doing? All of them um, induce the, either the increased production of amyloid or the increased production of a longer version which aggregates faster. And that's what these three different genes or mutations in these genes have in common. Now, there's uh, one mutation which I want to mention specifically. That's the so-called Swedish mutation here right at the end terminus. It's located exactly where beta secretase cleaves. And <clears throat> together with my friend Martin Citron, um, when we were postdocs in, in Boston at Harvard, um, we started luckily out with that mutation at the very beginning uh, because uh, luck was because that was the easiest one to investigate. And what we found was that this mutation increases amyloid production by a factor of about two to three, maybe a little bit more. And um, how it, how it, uh, and the way how it does it is it facilitates cleavage by beta secretase at this position. So there's simply more, more of amyloid being produced and that leads to Alzheimer's disease unequivocally, so with 100% penetrance. Now, if that is not enough evidence, there's additional evidence from the opposite, basically. Um, there were huge projects carried out on Iceland, um, not from our lab, a different lab, um, where people were searching for um, mutations which protect from Alzheimer's disease. So very important mutations because they could tell you how you prevent the disease, basically. And such mutations were now found and they were found in an Icelandic um, population in their family. And the mutation was, which would protects from Alzheimer's disease was located exactly here, exactly where the Swedish mutation is uh, located. But in contrast to what the Swedish mutation is doing, namely inducing amyloid production, this mutation here reduces amyloid production. Not very much, it's only by 20 to 30%, but that is sufficient throughout life to make these people getting 100 years old and older without developing a dementia and without developing Alzheimer's disease. So in principle, that's a field study where nature tried a clinical trial basically uh, by lowering amyloid throughout a long time and that prevents Alzheimer's disease. So to me, the genetic evidence is crystal clear that amyloid is on top of the disease and triggers the disease. Not alone, that's an important point, but it's triggering it. So the major trigger is of course amyloid, which when you make loss, less of amyloid, it's protective. If you make more amyloid too much, it causes the disease. So, I really think um, that uh, my colleagues in the entire field um, <clears throat> should come back to this genetic evidence and keep that in mind when they criticize the amyloid cascade. Certainly, um, not everything is correct in the amyloid cascade. And then there may be a lot of revisions um, in the near future, but the idea that amyloid is on top and, and triggers the disease, I think that has been proven. But there's one piece which we do not understand whatsoever. And these are the microglia cells. Even Alois Alzheimer, already more than 100 years ago when he was working here in Munich um, on the very first um, brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient, already described cells. Um, he didn't know the name microglia, of course, but he, he described and was drawing cells um, from this patient um, which looked like microglia. And he said um, that these cells were changed in a way that they appeared, um, yeah, they appeared to be sick. So what are we doing with these microglia cells? Now, for a long time, for decades, microglia cells were believed to cause the disease. And there's even part of the, the field which believes that microglia are sitting on top of the amyloid cascade. 
and microglia must be overactivated, then they start somehow to induce amyloid pathology in the whole amyloid cascade. Um, I was never working on, on that for more than 20 years because I thought this doesn't make, even some of this doesn't make any sense. Um, why should evolution develop um, immune cells in the brain, which cause when the disease starts to, to occur, major damage? This doesn't make sense evolutionarily. But I didn't understand that there were no genetic tools available. So I, I stood away until genes were identified or, or mutations in genes, which were associated um, with an extremely high risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. And a family of different genes were found and all of them had one thing in common. All of them were expressed exclusively in the brain in microglia cells. So these mutations in microglial expressed genes affected onset of Alzheimer's disease. And that finding made me to go into the field because now I had individual genes with individual mutations, which are causative for the disease. And now I could do functional experiments. Now, it turned out that many mutations occur in a gene called triggering receptor expressed myeloid cells 2 or TRAM2. And TRAM2 was known already for its uh, activity on attenuating inflammatory reactions. It seems to be a lipid sensor, which becomes more and more important, actually. Um, it's promoting phagocytosis, and it's <clears throat> selectively expressed, as I said, in myeloid cells in the brain, so in microglia in the brain, but also, of course, in macrophages um, in the periphery. Now, there are mutations, disease-causing mutations found. Um, in um, TRAM2, and when you have homozygous mutations, these patients develop a very terrible disease uh, called nasohacular disease. And heterozygous mutations um, cause late onset Alzheimer's disease and, and FTD like syndrome, FTD itself, ALS, or Parkinson's disease. So, this gene and its mutations, they are in the center of microglial biology. I was immediately convinced. And when that was found, I um, took a, an incredible risk. It was back in 2014, switching my lab completely um, from APP processing to, um, which by that time I thought has been investigated almost completely and we understood it very well and we understood the mutations very well. So by that time, then I switched completely to microglia, basically overnight, and um, also stopped a research focus in my lab, which was on Parkinson's disease. So my lab is now focusing only on Alzheimer's disease and FTD, and specifically on the involvement um, of microglia cells and the connection of microglia cells with neurons. So it's a complete new field. Now, I must admit, and that's something very important for scientists, um, we got very lucky at the beginning because when we looked at TRAM2, it had, had exactly the same topology as the amyloid precursor protein. So it's a type one protein, which sits in the membrane and um, is transported to the cell surface. And not only that, on the cell surface, it's cleaved by an enzyme which we knew very well, it's alpha secretase, which also cleaves the amyloid precursor protein in the middle of the amyloid domain in that case and prevents amyloid production. So we basically had all tools in our hands immediately to um, investigate processing of TRAM2 and its function. And we started out doing that by including two disease-causing mutations. There was a T66M and the Y38C mutation. And we expressed them not in microglia cells at the beginning. This was all way too complicated. We thought, let's go in simple systems. And we expressed them simply in Hectron and 3 cells. And although these were not microglia cells, they told us the whole story right away. It was a very simple experiment. So what you see here is the full length strand 2. Uh, which is expressed in, as a wild type protein in kidney cells. This is the immature version, which is translated into the ER, not glycosylated yet. And that's because it runs fairly sharp. This is the mature version of TRAM2, which is now glycosylated and like APP then runs more in a smeary way. So it's not a defined molecular, um, molecular weight. And that happens, and that, that version sits on the cell surface and is able to signal as a full-length protein. Now, when you look at the two mutations, you see immediately what happens. 
the immature version accumulates and the mature fully glycosylated version is basically wiped out. Now look at the C-terminal fragment. So that's this fragment here, which is generated after the cleavage. This is nicely present in the wild type, but strongly reduced in the mutations because simply, um, apparently, the protein cannot be cleaved anymore. And sure enough, if we look in the supernatant, soluble TRAM2, this version here, which is secreted, of course, in the media, is completely absent, whereas in the, in the wild type, um, there's a lot of it. So what that basically tells you is that these mutations have a very simple mechanism. They misfold the protein, and these misfolded proteins are hold back in the R and cannot reach the cell surface. And alpha secretase is known to, to cleave only in the cell surface. That's why we don't see the cleavages anymore. And signaling of TRAM2 also occurs from the cell surface. So to our big surprise, these mutations were loss of function mutations, clearly. And you can nicely see that when you look at phagocytosis. So in wild type, cells expressing wild type TRAM2 nicely phagocytose, the two mutations don't do this anymore. So this was strong indication, as I said, that the mutations in TRAM2 are loss of function mutations. So microglia lost, lose a pivotal function, which is typical for them, namely in that case, phagocytosis. But now I will show you many more phenotypes, which to a big surprise were changed and which um, or lost, and which basically um, yeah, were totally against the current picture by that time that activation of microglia is something bad. And the very first experiment we did is something um, what we also do in our patients here. So um, the, for the patients, we have a um, TSPO PET imaging, which allows us to monitor activation of microglia and inflammation basically um, in, this, in the brains of these patients. And we closely collaborate with these um, clinicians and we not only have the big pet for the patients, but we also have a micro pet for mice. And we use exactly the same tracers um, they're using for humans. And we basically get the leftovers um, from, uh, from them to use in our mice. And here we look at a wild type mouse from 2.5 to 12 months. And as more reddish the brain becomes, as more activated the microglia are. And what you see is that during aging, the microglia become more and more active and the brain becomes more and more reddish. So after one year, there are quite a number, there's quite a bit of, of activation of microglia. This was already a, a big surprise. But why should that happen? And it happens because these mice age. They have small myelin damage and could nicely show that. And this myelin, small myelin damage is recognized by the microglia cells and makes them activating. And the activated micro, microglia then move basically via chemotaxis um, to the sites of damage and try to repair and remove um, at, at the end um, amyloid uh, myelin trash. Now that's the wild type situation. Now, let's take a look at the mutant. So we crispr the mutant into the genome by just putting in the T66M mutation, doing nothing else. And you see immediately that the activation of the microglia over time is not working anymore. And this is something which made um, the good old people in the microglia field really crazy because what we said here basically then or concluded is that activation of microglia via TRAM2 must be protective. And if it doesn't work anymore, you develop Alzheimer's disease because the microglia cells cannot switch the activation state from homeostatic to an activation, activated state. And on a molecular level, this turned out to be true. So you may know in the meantime that um, there, there are a lot of different, with single cell sequencing, there have been a lot of different um, microglial um, stages being, or populations being isolated and characterized. And they range from a homeostatic signature to disease associated signature. So resting cells to activating cells. And there's a whole gradient. It's probably numerous different populations. Now on either side of them, on the homeostatic side and the disease associated side, so the two extremes, uh, we have signature, signatures of the trans transcriptome. And what I show you here um, on top are marker genes uh, for the homeostatic signatures of a microglia, which are not activated. In gray, you see the wild type. In red, you see the TRAM2 knockout, which behaves like a TRAM2 mutation. And you see it 
slightly but significantly increases um, the homeostatic stage. So nothing really spectacular, but something's happening. And so the homeostatic signature seems to be stabilized a little bit. Now, the big surprise came when we crossed in a mouse model for amyloid plugs. So that normally should immediately induce a switch from the homeostatic signature to a disease-associated signature. But when you have a tram 2 loss of function, you do the opposite. And you see that here in red. Then um, the um, homeostatic signature becomes super activated and the disease-associated signature is completely suppressed. So it's never reached. So that means tram mutations hold tram 2 or hold microglia in a homeostatic state. And that state was originally believed to be the good state. Now we say, if you lock the cells, the microglia cells in that state and do not allow them to be activated upon a challenge, be it amyloid plaques or whatever else, um, then it's disease causing. And you can show that very nicely in several different models. So for example, what we did here was a laser entry in the brain. So very crude and very simple experiment to just basically take a laser beam and, and burn a hole into the brain and then watch the microglia reacting to that. And they grow out the foot process, processes very fast. And after a few minutes, um, they have reached already the site of injury. If you do that in a tram 2 loss of function mutation, that takes much, much longer and never reaches really the amount of, of connection you normally see in the wild type. So the reactivity of these microglia cells is strongly, strongly reduced in, in a tram 2 loss of function. And you can also see, see that very nicely on migration and proliferation of these cells. So what we did here is that's a simple brain slice, which is cultured from a mouse which makes amyloid plaques and has a tram 2 white type gene, and the same amyloid plaque mouse with a tram 2 loss of function mutation. And you see immediately, so this is the um, edge of the um, brain slice, and the, the um, microglia cells tend to move out and, and populate basically um, the entire cover slip. And they do that very well when you have the um, TRAM2 gene around and they also proliferate. So you have a lot of cells sitting there migrating. And if you look at the TRAM2 knockout, you have much less microglia cells and they don't want to migrate anymore whatsoever. So again, clear indication that the loss of function causes the disease. So this has consequences for our amyloid plaque pathology, very severe consequences. And this has now been confirmed throughout the field by basically everybody. So what we see here, these are a mouse model again, which produces amyloid plaques. These are all these white dots here. And in green, you see microglia cells stained with the marker antibody. And you see that the microglia cells exactly sit where the amyloid plaques are located. So they move via chemotaxis to the amyloid plaques and cover them, basically in an attempt to degrade these amyloid plaques. Now, when you do the same experiment with the TRAM2 loss of function mutation, you will see that the microglia don't want to go anymore where the plaques are. They don't recognize them anymore. And this is a very severe phenotype. I mean, the difference is black and white. So, but that's of course now in mice, where we have a homozygous loss of function mutation and even a total loss of, of TRAM2. And the mutations themselves, they may lose like 80% or, or less even. And in patients, they occur heterozygous. So it's only one allele which is affected. But we went into patients, in Alzheimer patients, and checked for patients which have a mutation um, in TRAM2 on, and developed Alzheimer's disease. And we so this is a Alzheimer's disease control with a regular TRAM2 wild type gene. And these three here are cases with different TRAM2 mutations and Alzheimer's disease. And we stained here in brown uh, for microglia cells and in pink for amyloid, for amyloid plaques. And what you see right away is in the Alzheimer's disease control with the wild type TRAM2 gene, you see a lot of microglia cells clustering and covering the amyloid plaque. And this is not the case at all in these three mut mutant mutation carriers at all. And this came to me as a big surprise because um, these are heterozygous mutations and I expected that the effect 
of the mutations may be very hard to see um, in vivo or uh, postmortem, <laughs> I should say. And um, I thought that we may need super careful and intense quantification to see any differences. But when the pathologist showed me this, the, the slices blinded, I picked out, we had a total of seven um, mutation carriers and I picked out all of them blinded and could easily um, um, differentiate them um, from the AD control. So that tells you that what we found um, in mouse models holds true for the patients as well. Now, we made another very important observation. So what happens when, micro, when, when amyloid plaques are start to, starting to grow? So these amyloid plaques, um, in order to grow and to become apparent at all in, in, in our brain, they need little seeds like crystal. And you can induce the seeding by making a brain lysate from a mouse which has um, abundant plaques. You just, I mean, there's nothing special. You just homogenize it and take a little aliquot and then inject that into the brain of a mouse which not yet has amyloid plaques. And then what we do is we want to check for the little newborn amyloid plaques, so little seeds, which are newborn plaques and which are generated right at the beginning and reflect the earlier stage of Alzheimer's disease pathology via amyloid. And that works nicely and has been shown many, many times by Matthias Jokan. We collaborated with him and, and one of his um, postdocs or now professors as well. And what you see here, all these red and green dots here, um, they are seeded amyloid plugs, little, little, tiny, tiny, tiny plugs, much, much smaller than the ones which I've shown you before. Now, this happens when you do that in a mouse which has a wild type TRAM2 gene. And this happens when you have a mouse which, which has a TRAM2 loss of function. You see immediately that these seeds become much more abundant and they also grow, they're much bigger. So what we could show is that the microglia cells here nicely recognize even these super small um, uh, seeds here right away and migrate there and degrade them. Whereas here, they don't reach them at all. So that means again, that this TREM2 function becomes super important right during the time when the disease starts, namely when amyloid seeds are starting to precipitate. So that means we have a very early function, loss of function caused by these TREM2 mutations, at least in our mouse models. So this would have no direct evidence for treatment. So you know that nowadays, one, one of the most hopeful treatment um, are these anti-amyloid immune therapies. And you know the story from aducanumab, which has just been approved um, by the FDA in, in the US for um, treatment of patients in the public. And these antibodies, what they do is something very simple. They um, are raised to amyloid, they reach the amyloid plug, bind to the amyloid plug, and then they attract microglia cells, which take the plug apart and digest it basically. So what we thought immediately then is that a TRAM2 function in microglia cells would be required for these aducanumab-like antibodies to remove plaques or prevent plaque formation in the brain. So we did a very simple experiment. We used an antibody called gantanerumab. That's an antibody which is basically identical to aducanumab, recognizing a very similar epitope, uh, but is generated by a different company. And um, we used that antibody and um, mixed it with amyloid fibers. And then we gave these amyloid fibers together with the antibody in increasing amounts of antibody um, to bone marrow derived macrophages, so myeloid cells, with the wild type TRAM2 gene in black or in gray with the TRAM2 knockout. And then we looked how much of this amyloid would be engulfed in microglia cells in order to degrade it and digest it basically. And what you see is that the wild type cells engulf much more with increasing amounts of antibodies of the amyloid fibers as the knockouts. So that shows you already here that probably a treatment paradigm where a microglial treatment at an anti-amyloid treatment, um, in that case, the best would be to have a combined treatment with a drug 
against amyloid, which would be the antibody, like under Neuromap, and an antibody or a drug which activates microglia cells. And that's shown very nicely here. So what we have here are brain slices for mice. And um, in green, you see little dots are plaques. And we added on top of these um, brain slices, uh, microglia, in that case, isolated from wild type mice. And then we incubated these slices in addition with increasing amounts of um, the gandaneromab antibody. And you see in a dose dependent manner, these microglia cells are being activated, recognize um, the plaques better and better and better and digest them and they're gone basically with a high concentration. And if you do the same thing with the tram 2 loss of function, you see it still does work, but it, it's much less. So the anti-amyloid immune therapy depends on a TRAM2 function in microglia, which means a lot for future treatments. So, and that's exactly what we currently are focusing on. We want to treat Alzheimer's disease in a, in a combinatorial trial, basically, using anti-amyloid antibodies, but using something in addition, which activates protective functions of microglia to facilitate digestion and prevention of amyloid plaque pathology. And, but before we wanted to do that is we thought it's very nice to have evidence in, in, in mouse models and tissue culture and even iPSCs, which I don't even show you. So we have a lot of human microglia cells now around. And this all confirms that preclinically we are on the right track here. But what about humans? So in humans, of course, we cannot do uh, in any kind of CRISPR modification. But what we have is we participate in Diane. And Diane is a dominantly inherited net Alzheimer's disease network. And here, numerous um, institutions throughout the world collect these super rare patients which suffer from familiar Alzheimer's disease. So here we have currently 127 carriers and 91 non-carriers. And the non-carriers are the siblings of the mutation carriers, so they're the best controls. And the idea behind was now, we wanted to measure soluble TRAM2, the amount of soluble TRAM2 in CSF. So why measuring soluble TRAM2 in CSF? Because soluble TRAM2 can only be generated after TRAM2 reaches the cell surface, performed signaling, and then it's cleaved to terminate the signaling. So soluble TRAM2 is a surrogate marker for the amount of TRAM2 signaling of TRAM2 function, which occurred originally. So as more soluble TRAM2 is there, most likely as more TRAM2 signaling should have taken place. So that's the reason or the rationale behind our biomarker study here. And at the beginning, we made a very a surprising observation. So when you look in blue, these are the non-carriers, the amount of TRAM2, soluble TRAM2 slowly increases away chain. Why? This again reminded us what we saw in mice before. In wild type mice, we also saw an activation of microglia cells throughout normal physiological aging. So humans also have small myelin damage, and that's probably the reason why we activate our microglia cells as well. And this is certainly something protective. This cannot be something bad. And now look at the mutation carriers. They do this, the same thing over aging, but they do it much stronger because now they, these guys, unfortunately, develop a very severe amyloid plug pathology. So they develop as a response um, TRAM2 expression and TRAM2 uh, increased TRAM2 functions. And now what I show you here is a bit outdated. So um, we basically aligned all our, um, our um, Diane patients um, based on the, on the age when they um, developed the disease. So EU estimated uh, expected years from onset, zero means basically the date when these patients develop the, the disease. And now plus five means um, that they are five years be, um, after they were starting to develop, minus five is five years before. And by, that, by doing that, we can align all patients which have different ages of onset into one basically big um, cohort of patients. And what we see here that the mutation carriers um, increase TRAM2 already five years before the onset, before the patient shows any no symptoms whatsoever. At this time, they already increased TRAM2. Now, based on brand new experiments, which we are just about to submitting actually today, um, is we found um, with the new and more sensitive assay that this increase of soluble TRAM2 
already occurs up to 21 years before the disease starts and is completely driven by amyloid production. So amyloid comes first, as I've shown you before in the mice, where you have the seeds and these induced um, the microglial function or response. And that's exactly happening here. So trend two is then expressed in, in more expressed in microglia cells and they start to respond to the challenge already more than 20 years before the onset of the disease. So very sensitive also in humans. Now, this is important because um, the induction of TRAM2 correlates um, with the CDR, so a measurement of cognitive ability. So as soon as the number increases here, the cognitive ability drops and uh, this correlates nicely with TRAM expression. So the microglia recognize um, probably the neuronal debris caused by um, neurodegeneration at these time points. Now, what I mentioned um, just a minute ago with a more sensitive assay, which is the work which we are just submitting, um, this was a longitudinal study. So we followed individual patients within Diane now over time, the previous data were cross-sectional. And we made some incredibly important observations. So what we see here is the rate of um, soluble TRAM2 change compared to um, the rate of change in cortical shrinkage. And what you see easily in the pre-symptomatic phase, long before the patients show any kind of symptoms, as higher the TRAM2 levels are, as better the cortex is protected from shrinkage. This has immediate consequences for memory. Again, when you have high levels of, of um, pre-symptomatic green, um, sort of a TRAM2, as higher these levels are, as better the cognitive outcome. So that clearly means now that one could probably modulate TRAM2 function in order to, to prevent or slow Alzheimer's disease. And this is not only occurring in um, the familiar Alzheimer's disease cases, but also in the sporadic cohorts. So we, we use the famous ethnic cohort. And again, we saw exactly the same thing. So patients with high levels of TRAM2 in blue, they show over the years less hippocampal volume shrinkage as those with low levels. They show less clinical progression and they show a better cognitive outcome. So it's not like many people always claim that um, familiar Alzheimer's disease and sporadic Alzheimer's disease is so different. At least these TRAM2 functions are preserved in both of them, very similar. So this now led us um, to the idea that we may be able to modulate TRAM2 function in a protective therapeutic way. And we started to do this with a very similar idea, simple idea. So this cleavage here by alpha secretase or ADAM10 destroys the phonex TRAM2 and then it should prevent signaling. So we thought let's simply um, block the protease with the protease inhibitor. So we did and measured phagocytosis. And if we in inhibit that cleavage here, we indeed see more phagocytosis, meaning that you have more cell autonomous signaling. And when you cleave, it seems to be stopped. Now, but this is certainly no treatment because alpha secretase it prevents Alzheimer's disease actually and does not induce it. And you all know the disaster with the secretase inhibitors in clinical trials. So it's secretases, they have important functions in the brain, physiological functions, which you cannot eliminate. This would be crazy to do this once again. So we thought about something much more selective where you find a drug which only prevents TRAM2 cleavage, but not the cleavage by the same protease from numerous other substrates. So how can we do this? So we thought, let's block the cleavage. So, but if you want to do this, you first need to know the cleavage site. And we did this via mass spec. It's a complicated experiment, but, but which we have done many times before in our time when we worked on secretases. And we found here only one cleavage of the cystidine 157. So very precise cleavage mediated by alpha secretase. So now we had the idea that if there's only one cleavage, we should be able to make antibodies to this region here. And these antibodies should compete with alpha secretase, basically prevent alpha secretase from recognizing its substrate because the antibody is sitting there already and occupies it, and therefore then should increase signaling. 
So we screened a whole lot of antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, and our lead antibody is called 4D9. And this 4D9 antibody binds at this epitope here, 12 amino acids before the critical histidine. So that's where the cleavage takes place. And here our antibody binds. And that's close enough to this cleavage site that these bulky, huge antibodies certainly pre should prevent um, binding of the protease and prevent its cleavage. And we tested that, of course, and we see a very nice dose-dependent inhibition of shedding of TRAM2 with an EC50 of 3.7 nanomolar. So this antibody has an incredible affinity and efficacy. Similarly, in a dose-dependent manner, 49 induces signaling of TRAM2. Moreover, it also, again, in a dose-dependent manner, with a very low EC50 of 5.6 nanomolar, increases survival of microglia cells. And it also increases uptake of cellular debris. And here we use myelin, but you can also use dead neurons or amyloid. So this antibody did on a biochemical level exactly what we hope um, that it should do. So we set up a mouse experiment and a vivo experiment, a first treatment experiment. In the meantime, we've done many, many more. And um, here we treated a mouse which develops amyloid plaques over 10 days with 50 milligram per kick of the antibody. So you need to use a lot because the antibody by itself doesn't go across the blood brain barrier or very small, lab, small amounts only. So you have to increase the dose very high to get small amounts into the brain, but with 50 milligrams per kick, um, this is working and we checked this. And so we knew that the antibody is indeed then reaching the brain. And in the brain, we also determined it's binding to TRAM2. We could show that at these concentrations, the antibody fully binds sort of TRAM2 or, or TRAM2 in the brain of these mice. Now, after 10 days, we sacrificed the mice and simply looked at the pathology. So these are the normal plugs here in a wild type mouse, not uh, in, in, a, in a mouse um, treated with an irrelevant antibody, an isotype. And these are the amyloid plaques, how they look like after treatment is 49. So what you see is that the size of the plaques was shrinking and apparently only the cores are left. And the cores are the super um, fibrilla um, stuff, which formed a lot of beta sheets. And apparently that material is not recognized by microglia anymore, but the more diffuse material in the halo of the amyloid plaque, that's what, what's recognized. And that's what's reduced by 49 activated microglia cells. So a very promising result. And what's even more promising is you now we use the antibody in the meantime in several different disorders where myeloid, myeloid cell function is required. And here we looked at a demyelination injury, which we induced by lysolecithin. Actually, this was done by our collaborator, Mika Simons, here in house. And um, we, we then did the 49 experiments together. And then during a repair, um, we added um, 49 or a um, irrelevant antibody control. And the results are very, very strong. So what we see um, during the repair phase um, that the um, foam cells, which are a sign of misfunctional microglia cells are dramatically reduced by 49. So it basically go away. And the amount of remyelination during the recovery phase um, is much better. So we speed up um, remyelination <clears throat> and make it more efficient. Now, <clears throat> in the meantime, we are also <clears throat> using the same <clears throat> we're using the same antibody um, for a lot of different um, diseases as well. So we are using it in retinal degeneration, but also in peripheral diseases, for example, obesity. And Everywhere where we start to use these antibodies, we see at least um, some positive effects. So we induce a microglial or macrophage population, which seems to have protective functions in different types of disorders throughout the body. Now, in the last two slides, I want to show you um, a major concern which came up. And if you have seen um, our review article, which appeared recently in, in Neuron, um, I described a big problem, um, and that is that the antibody may induce hyperactivation of the microglia, because we have to give it continuously over long time periods, so we may overinduce microglia cells. 
And that happens in a very famous disease, and this is FTD. And this is a version of FTD, where, which is characterized by loss of progranulin. And if you have a loss of progranulin, then these patients and our mice, they show hyperactivated microglia. So um, in a TSP open imaging, these um, brains show a huge signal, whereas trying to knock out shows the opposite. Now, when we look at FDG PET, so the amount of sugar uptake and basically measurement of microglial function then, um, in both cases, drastically reduced, suggesting that these microglia here and here do not work properly anymore. Now, our antibody shifts this type of microglia to that type or at least in long run to that type. Maybe if you do it for a shorter time to an intermediate form. So are these hyperactivated microglia indeed so bad as it's claimed by basically everybody in the field? And I believe that as well. So we did a very simple um, experiment. So we took the program and knockout, which have this hyperactivated microglia and thought, well, let's get rid of the hyperactivation by crossing in a tram to knock knockout. Very simple because a tram to knockout should prevent activation of microglia, and it does. So here you see in, in dark pink, you see the um, genes activated in the disease associated signature um, of these hyperactivated microglia cells. And when you do a um, tram to knockout, um, you see um, that these are completely prevented. And uh, the tram to double knockout in a progranulin together with a progranulin knockout does that also very nicely. So you rescue at least parts of the signature, but highly significantly. So if you cross in a tram two knockout into the progranulin knockout, we reduce hyperactivation of microglia, definitely. So if hyperactivated microglia are bad, then I would expect that if we reduce hyperactivation, neurodegeneration should drop. And that's what we expected. And that's why we did the experiment. And that's, we observed, however, exactly the opposite. So if we prevent hyperactivation of microglia cells, then a marker of neurodegeneration, which is NFL, shoots the roof. So we would have expected exactly the opposite, but now we get tremendous neurodegeneration. And not only that, the abnormal structure of these um, hyperactivated microglia cells becomes even more abnormal um, in, the, in, the, in the double knockout. And so the FDG PET signal could also not be rescued. So what does that mean? That at the end means that even hyperactivated microglia cells, which were believed to be the worst cell type you can have in your brain, can at least have over some time protective functions. And there was recently um, a paper in um, Neuron published by Genentech, and they out, outright claimed in a super um, strong neurodegenerative disease model that hyperactivated microglia in their model are protective. So they wrote that these hyper damn microglia cells, that they have pro still protective functions. So for us in principle, also, I should be super careful here. This may be good news that, our, that, that with our antibody, we do not shoot, um, we do not shoot over and basically cause in the long run harm to the patients. But of course, this has to be still carefully checked. The other thing what we still have to check very carefully is we need to get the antibody into the brain. We cannot um, fill up the human, the human patient with lots of huge amount of antibody um, in order to get a small amount into the brain. So it's not very cost effective and that will certainly also cause side effects um, in the periphery. So we started that together with our friends at Denali and the Denali people have developed a beautiful system um, to get antibodies across the brain, a so-called brain shuttle system. These experiments are running and with the brain shuttle system, um, we reach much higher concentrations or much more efficient transport of the antibody to the brain with very nice um, phenotypic readouts. So that's basically where we stand with the antibody. Um, after we published the effects of our antibody, um, two companies, um, MGN and Elector, were publishing their antibodies as well. And to my big surprise, these antibodies, also in all these cases, we and the others um, have screened antibodies against the entire ectodomain of TRAM2. 
the antibodies which have protective effects, they all bind to this so-called stalk region here, which harbors the cleavage site of TREM2, and all of them block or apparently block shedding of TREM2. And in addition, what I have not mentioned so far is they also cross-link, of course, TREM2 and induce signaling. So these antibodies, which are currently developed by companies and by in, in, in my lab together with Dinelli, um, they have all probably a very similar dual mechanism. Now with that, I'm at the end and I hope that um, in a couple of years, um, we'll be ready to get this antibody into clinical trials and hopefully into a combinatorial trial as anti-amyloid antibodies and these combinatorial trials in mice, um, they have been set up currently in my lab, but they of course uh, take a long, long time until they are ready for analysis. And with that, I'm at the end and want to thank, first of all, all the people in my lab. This is a fantastic team, which I have currently in my lab, which basically work now only on microglia effects on neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease and FTD. I also want to thank all my previous um, lab members who did fantastic work, which all this current work is um, being based on. Mm -hmm. And I uh, wanted to thank specifically our friends at Dinelli. Um, this is one of the best, or the, the best collaboration I really ever had in my life, where we really work hand in hand. Um, they do experiments which we cannot do and vice versa. And together then um, we make major findings, which we then also publish right away. And um, I also want to thank our team at another biotech company located here close to my lab called ESA. And finally, of course, um, we had many collaborators. I briefly mentioned uh, Mika Simons, um, who did the experiments um, with the myelin um, uh, damage um, model system. Um, Dominic Paquet is collaborating with us on his systems, on his system, um, how to generate um, micro, human microglia, human neurons, and so on from IPSC derived cells. And we have many other collaborators, including um, Regina Friedelde, um, who is um, producing monoclonal antibodies. And last but not least, of course, I need to thank all the clinicians which were involved in Diane and Adney, and of course, all the patients and the relatives who made these two cohorts um, possible. And with that, I'm at the end, and thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, what a fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, you have a very uh, interesting way of presenting a very difficult data in a very simple way. That's uh, that's by itself is a very nice skill. To, so uh, our audience, I would like to thank Professor Christian Hans for his uh, uh, nice presentation and the data that he went through. I can't summarize what he said, but it was very clear that microglia has a very clear uh, evidence in Alzheimer's disease by forming the amyloid uh, plaque and restoring this uh, hemostasis of the brain, uh, which is important for brain physiology. Uh, in 1907, Professor Alzheimer uh, described the reactive glia cell within the plaques and almost uh, uh, we, uh, the researcher currently founding, finding why this is happening and how to suppress this process of aggregation of this protein and at the same time uh, avoiding the accumulation of the uh, plaque. Uh, Prof, there's many questions which is coming here, so I will go uh, through them as we are having almost 15 minutes to answer most of these questions. Question number one is, uh, what are the consequences of R6-2H and the other two variants? Um, so I didn't understand the mutation. It's like, exactly. So the mutations, there are different mutations, of course. Some of them, like the ones I showed, were complete loss of function mutations. Um, the R48, R47H mutation, for example, which is strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease, causes a partial loss of function specifically for ligand binding. So it reduces ligand binding and, and, and lipid sensing and therefore reduces trend to function, but it's not a total loss of function. That should be mentioned, of course, yes. Okay, uh, there's another question. Uh, is there any mutation specific to the Middle East population like the one that you described with the TREM2? Yeah, so not for the Middle East um, population, but there's one in China. 
Um, so there's one mutation which specifically occurs in China, and that does something very interesting. So it increases the shedding and therefore reduces dramatically the amount of TREM2 full lengths on the cell surface and therefore reduces um, um, signaling, which I found very interesting. So the mutation doesn't exist um, in Central Europe and not in America, I think, um, it was specifically found in China. Interest. There's an interest uh, questions. Uh, what what makes uh, beta amyloid and tau protein, which is exist in a healthy brain, uh, also to cause other new, uh, degenerative disease like Alzheimer? Oh, so it's specifically true for tau, of course. So there are many different tauopathies, and um, but tau also accumulates in Alzheimer's disease, and that was a big mystery for a long, long time. And um, there's now, I think it's coming out on Thursday. Um, in Nature, in a paper um, from Michel Gödert, um, who made a fantastic observation, which I think couldn't be evaluated high enough. What he found by cryo-EM, he looked at the different tangles caused by, or, or actu tau aggregations caused by the different types of FTD. And he found for every individual FTD, a very specific and selective type of structure. So there are different tau structures, which cause different types of the disease. So the structure determines the disease. And that's something which I find super interesting because that's also important for treatment. And it also suggests that in Alzheimer's disease, the presence of amyloid induces a tau form, which does lead to Alzheimer's disease, not to FTD, because these patients don't develop FTD, they develop Alzheimer's disease. Interesting. So that will bring me to another question. Do you think Alzheimer's disease is a syndrome more than a disease, and we are speaking about different uh, yeah. type of process which is going there, but we clump them under one process, which is Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, that's a bit the problem. I totally agree. Um, there are a lot of patients, I think at least 50, you know, well, 40 percent of the patients, they show co pathology with TDP43. And TDP43 is a characteristic protein which occurs in FTD, many FTD cases. And there's another 40% of AD cases which show Lewy bodies. And Lewy bodies, as you all know, of course, they're characteristic for Lewy body diseases. And we don't know their contribution to the disease. So that's something I'm desperately interested. We need to better understand this co-pathology, I think. Interesting. So uh, uh, in the same area regarding the Alzheimer's disease and the biomarkers, do you think that we have in the uh, clinical field or preclinical field uh, research in the research uh, field about the biomarkers, serum, CSF, or radiological to diagnose these patients in very early stage? Yeah, this is a, I think this is the biggest challenge which we have in the field right now. So I think, as I said, I think we, we do have drugs which may work like aducanumab, gandanegumab, all these antibodies, they may have efficacy if given early enough. But how do we identify the patients? So we need biomarkers which get them not five years before the beginning of the disease, but we need to identify patients of risk 20, 20 years before the beginning of the disease. And those markers we don't have yet. It can be imaging markers, I think. It can be lipid markers, maybe. Um, some kind of, of metabolism markers. Um, but that's something um, which really the field must work on it because without that, we will never treat the disease. Interesting. Because that we are seeing, uh, what we are seeing in the cl uh, clinical practice uh, daily, when the patient is coming, the family will, uh, will bring father or mother with, with uh, start to forget where's their key, where's their wallet and others. That is an advanced stage of Alzheimer's process. Exactly. Do, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So for yeah. them, it's, it's, every treatment is coming too late. To say it's and, true, and, and that and that's not only with Alzheimer's; it's with all neurodegenerative disease, including Parkinson's disease. Yeah, and I totally agree. Yeah, interest. Uh, uh, th there's a question here. Uh, uh, do you think that using artificial intelligence combined with the machine learning uh, is a useful tool to copy the dementia patients? Uh, I think I think it will be, but um, that's a field I have no clue, unfortunately. Um, I was just in, shortly before the before the seminar started asked from the from the from a very important funding agency in Europe um, to review a grant on on artificial intelligence and I turned it down because I don't know enough about it. So that's really a field for which I'm too old, unfortunately. I think it has a big future for young scientists. 
interest. Uh, uh, before we uh, we come to the last question, do you think that there's an env uh, environmental factor in Alzheimer disease like Pitts type toxic other than genetic? Genetic is one part of the problem, mm -hmm. but there's the env environmental, like in Parkinson's disease, we have traumatic Parkinson, vascular Parkinson, genetic Parkinson, and other type of Parkinson. Do you think the same thing with the Alzheimer? There's env environmental and toxic. Yeah, there's something going on with environment, definitely. So um, our clinicians um, always recommend um, that old people or people which are getting old, they should take care of the blood, pre blood pressure, keep it low, um, prevent obesity, have healthy food, um, keep the brain active by exercising, and also keep the body active by exercising. So um, there are certainly environmental um, influences which yeah, they, they may support the disease um, process. And when you correct them, they may slow it down, but they may not prevent it. So it's, it's not causative, it's not, not really preventing, but it, it could slow the disease at least a little bit and take the risk down a little bit. So that's something um, every patient should be recommended, of course. Or every person who gets old, even healthy people. I agree. So uh, w one of the things as a clinician uh, in our practice, uh, vascular dementia is one of the largest risk of having an early Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Prof. Uh, uh, Hitchinski, who's running the vascular dementia chapter in the WFN, he just mentioned that almost 25% of the patients who label as Alzheimer patients, they have these cardiovascular yeah. risk factors that you spoke about uncontrolled high blood pressure, diabetic patient, dyslipidemia, recurrent stroke, obesity, unhealthy, all these can contribute to having a bad Alzheimer if you have the chance or early. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, this is something really, really important. In fact, we have a big grant system here set up where we work on the interaction between vascular dysfunction and neurodegeneration. And in addition, I've showed you the picture of my new institute half of the institute is occupied by, an, or, the, or, the, or the building is occupied by an institute for stroke and dementia research. And the government brought us directly together. So, so the, the, the Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases with the Center for Stroke and, and Dementia to, to force us to work together, which makes a lot of sense because we strongly believe that there's a huge interaction. Interest, interest. The, the, uh, more questions are coming. So sorry about that, Prof. No problem. Uh, okay, there's one question is coming here. Alzheimer's disease will occur if there's a mutation or not of yes. TAM2. How active are the microglia in the normal Alzheimer patients or are there different kinds of Alzheimer's disease? As we said, the uh -huh. TAM2 yes. will, the term two will, will, uh, will only work only in the ones with the mutation. Is that correct? So, uh, the, the, the normal microglia, the healthy microglia, the protective microglia, they need to have active wild-type um, functional TRAM2. And they um, will help to slow progression of the disease. Um, they will not prevent it, but they will slow progression of the disease. Now, if you have a TRAM2 loss of function mutation, it's a slight loss, um, not like, like, a, like a knockout, but over time, um, that means that you have a higher probability to develop late onset Alzheimer's disease. So I think it's the same type of disorder, but the patients with the TRAM2 loss of function or with the TRAM2 mutations, they just show you what the microglia, at least they show you the, the um, capacity of um, active microglia in, in reducing progression of the disease, not preventing, that should be crystal clear. So a TRAM2 um, treatment alone would probably not work, but I think a TRAM2 treatment together with anti-amyloid, that should work. So it's part of the whole story, which is, exactly. it's not exactly. the, the whole solution, but it's play a role there. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Another questions here. Um, uh, okay. What is the treatment for our aging? Uh, uh, there's a question by Dr. Uh, Ashuru, uh, uh, Muhammad Al Shurbagi. Uh, soluble term 2 determination uh, as a biomarker, I think maybe he meant a solution. 
uh, is there a research in the clinical practice soon to, to, to identify this biomarker? Yes, so that's something what we really plan to do. So um, we want to, have, yeah, I should explain that. So um, we think that patients which have low levels of TREM2, or we, we know that they have a bad cognitive prediction in the long run of the disease. So it's exactly those patients which have low levels of TREM2 increasing dramatically, which should get a TREM2 modulation antibody. So, and so we should divide the patients in low and high TREM2. That's what we try. Try. Um, I don't know if it's working, um, but um, we are very much inter interested currently in, in investigating um, the patients which had been treated with scandinaria in Diane. So there was a paper recently in Nature Medicine appearing showing the effects of these antibodies, and we want to now split the patients into low and high TREM2 and then see the outcome. And our prediction would be the ones with low TREM2, um, they had a better um, uh, outcome then because the ones with high TREM2, nothing could be changed anymore. Interesting. So that will be a, a, an interest area for research and to get these people in very early stage to, to the identif identify them. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so the last two questions I will decide here. Uh, could, uh, okay, so to estimate time later, the results. Yeah, so Khaled Ahmed is asking, would it possible to estimate a timeline to translate the result of these research into practice? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Very difficult. So I've been asked it many times, um, also from the press specifically, um, when are we ready to, for treatment basically? And when I was young, I always said, well, next 10 years, I should definitely work, but uh, these 10 years are over, of course, and the next 10 years are also over, of course. And so I, I am now super careful with that because you never know um, what the patients tell us. Um, there are so many caveats and we should not make wrong hopes for, for our patients and their relatives. So I think this is really important. And that's something I think as a scientist, you have to learn the hard way. I agree. Okay, so, so uh, just the la uh, last question was coming from my side. Uh, Abixa was the last medication came in late uh, 80s and we didn't have anything for almost more than 30, 35 years. Having the new antibodies monoclonal is a new window and hope for many uh, Alzheimer patients. Do you think that we will have more of these uh, type of uh, uh, drugs, which is, will be in the market soon, is that correct? I guess so. There are definitely, um, I think, three or four different um, antibodies currently developed, which already show um, effects on um, memory stabilization. And so I think um, there's a good chance that one of these antibodies, or maybe all of them, or some of them, um, will at the long run be used in the public. Um, but there are many, many caveats. Um, and the, the biggest problem is, of course, that most of the patients, unfortunately, which you see in your clinic, um, they are not eligible anymore because you see them because they're demented. So yeah. um, you need to see them way before they are demented in order to treat them. And that's the, the big, big, big problem in our field. So at the end, our audience, it was my pleasure today to, to be with Professor Christian Hess from Munich, Germany. He's the head of the research for Alzheimer in Munich. At the same time, he's one of the awarded uh, scientists by uh, Hamdan Award in 2005-2006. Uh, in, uh, I would like to thank Hamdan Award uh, for uh, hosting this webinar and to get us uh, uh, excellent speakers with a scientist who will update us about a uh, di very difficult area in the neuroscience field. Prof, thanks for being with us tonight and Thank wish you a good night. Thank you very much to all of you for listening. Thank you, bye-bye.